Okay, good afternoon. You know, I have to apologize for our third panelist, Teal, because he's ill and couldn't make it, but I think with two distinguished guests, we'll make an engaging dialogue. So let's get started. You know, the first question is really your definition of a perfect ad experience in a mobile and social age. Maybe let's start it with Katrina. You can also have a brief introduction of yourself and the company. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm Katarina. I used to work in media, so um, I know what I talk about when I talk about advertising. I used yeah. to be the CEO of Spiegel Online, and I'm now the Chief Open Innovation Officer of Mozilla, the best known for the Firefox browser. And uh, it will not surprise you to hear that, in my opinion, um, the best ad experience is one that, first of all, respects my privacy and does not collect every single bit of data it can get, that does not sell my data to a whole layer of other ed tech companies, and that does not follow me around and track me across the internet in the most creepy way. Apart from that, I think um, advertising that doesn't interrupt my user experience, so please don't give me stuff that lays itself over everything where I have to search forever to find the X to get it away. Please, people, no autoplay of videos. I don't want to look for the one of my 80 tabs that plays the video in a meeting and I can't find it. And uh, last but not least, I think um, we have kind of forgotten the art of storytelling in advertising. Tell me a good story. Show me something beautiful. Don't just scream, bye, bye, bye at me. Yeah, I was saying, you know, so, but it's, it's a delicate balance, I mean, to say, stop following me, but at the same time, you know, I think you would also beg a good experience that the advertiser would really understand your needs. How do you strike that balance? Well, I'm, I'm old, so maybe I'm attached <laughs> to the good old times and the past. But I think there is actually a balance. I don't mind, as a user, I don't mind sharing some data with an advertiser in exchange for a better service or free content. I, I, I'm not opposed to advertising per se, but as a user, I have no control over my data anymore. I don't know what I'm opting into. I don't know where my data goes. It's, it's not a relationship anymore between a user, a content creator, and a brand advertiser anymore. There's a whole middle layer that runs and makes off with my data. And I have, as a user, I have no control over that. And of course, that disturbs me. And I think there there is and, and there can be a better balance. We just haven't bothered in the yeah, last I, year. I think that's, that's, that's fair and you have more transparency and then have more control yeah. on the consumer side. And in terms of storytelling, I think that's uh, something, Lucy, you could share with us a bit more, your definition of a, a perfect ad experience. Yeah. Yes, uh, well, uh, uh, well, I'm Lucy first, and uh, I run a media, a free media, which is not a detail. We definitely need advertising to, to be alive and to keep going. And uh, we, we address a young audience that don't always have the time, the means, I mean, to afford like uh, paying medias or stuff like that. So it's really important for us. But uh, they also have like needs in terms of advertising because they have needs in terms of like they are looking for products, they, they like products, they buy products, they consume. So the, the big thing for us is to save their time and, and not give them like, like something that doesn't fit with their values or their likes. And so we have to have this good storytelling and I totally agree with you. And this good storytelling about like stories that fit and look like them, you know, uh, it's definitely something important for us. The big thing as well for us, and um, I think internet improved a lot uh, on these aspects uh, uh, these last, last few months, I would say, is crystal clear advertising. It has to be definitely clear and you don't have to ask yourself if it's advertising or if it's something else or if it's an opinion or it has to be clearly identified and certified and 
important, and it's checked advertising. So it's something on which we, we have, to, we have to, to, to focus on. It's a question of responsibility. Yeah, but share with us a little bit more about story storytelling and how do you create a native ad that's really capturing the attention of a younger audience on social? Well, uh, as, uh, as I said about like uh, featuring the values and the likes, it's quite important. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, what we've been doing on Combini, is uh, we try to conceive advertising experience like with uh, the likes of their generation and the values of their generation, uh, sometimes the assets and the musicians they like, and sometimes like um, the creativity and the colors of the moment, and sometimes like uh, their questions and their matters of the moment. And it's definitely something that will catch their attention. Uh, it's the good way to speak with them. And that's the first. Uh, I think we have, we have you know, encouraged people to ask questions on Slido. We had a very interesting question that I also wanted to ask is that you know, at the stage where I think the big platforms are increasingly trying to provide personalized advertising, targeted advertising to people, and the younger generation seems to be susceptible to that, but at the same time, can you actually do that without collecting a lot of data, but only collecting the kind of data that you allow the, uh, the platforms or media or third party to collect? We've been talking about personalization, both of advertising and content for so many years, and I still don't see it working. If the ads that I currently get are personalized to me, I don't want to know that person that surfs with my devices at night because I want none of whatever the personalized ad experience delivers me. Um, so I think it's actually not working particularly well. And I'm also a big believer in serendipity. I find some of the most interesting things, whether it's goods or, um, or content, more by chance. I don't want everything super tailored to my own little echo chamber. Maybe that is my own preference. But I think you can still, if I'm on a fashion blog, well, obviously, I'm interested in fashion, so please give me, give me fashion advertising. Mm -hmm. The same is true if I'm on like the car section of a big newspaper or something like that. But that doesn't mean that that beautiful black dress I looked at three weeks ago and either decided against or already bought needs to follow me around the web like a stray dog. That's, that's not personalized. That is just creepy and super annoying. And it's not going to make me any more inclined to, to buy more. anything. I think the, the kind of content I'm looking at, the environment, the website I'm surfing, or the search term I've put in gives you a lot of clues as to what I'm interested in and looking for. You don't need, you don't need to figure out my location and what my browser yeah. model is and my computer. And you don't need to put a cookie on my machine that keeps following me around yeah, everywhere. But, but, but can you, do you believe that you know, what you, uh, your company is doing can change the practice of the ecosystem? Because it's not only one browser, it's really like the whole, what the others are doing, the third parties are doing, the third party exchanges are doing, because everyone seems to collecting people's behavior and location data and try to sell it to someone else. How do we actually change that? I think that we're in the middle of a big shift that everybody is aware of and tries to figure out how to deal with. If you've seen, and I followed that closely while I was still on the publishing side, if you followed the rise of ad blocking, that was driven by consumers. That was people voting with their feet. I don't want to be tracked. I don't want to see this particular kind of badly made advertising. That was people voting with their feet. Um, and we're not the, we just launched a new version with an enhanced tracking protection. To be very clear, we don't block particular kinds of advertising. We're not judging a banner ad or a video or anything. We just want to protect users from being tracked and give them more choice. And you see that Safari has implemented that, Chrome has implemented that. You see that across the web with, with different models and different devices. And um, 
in part because of that, I think native advertising arose because it gave a new version of storytelling and it fit into the content experience and you didn't need to tailor it and track people. So I think we're not there yet. And most importantly, we haven't found a good balance in the ecosystem yet that, that um, supports content creators. But I think the shift is happening. Yeah, I think giving people choice is kind of interesting. And then, Lucy, your audience is 15 to 35, so millenn millennium and uh, Generation Z. And what's the attitude towards uh, privacy? Do you think that they are more open that, you know, to the fact that their data, personal data are being tracked? And then, of course, on the other hand, there's an, also an interesting question from Slido saying that, you know, for their preference, are they preferring more video ads versus display ads? No, actually, we, we, we don't sell that ads. Uh, we just sell stories. Yeah. So it's quite like really not my concern to be true because we, we don't sell uh, we don't sell data. Yeah. Uh, the thing is that, um, or, well, when we tell stories, it's like uh, it's something they can like share or like, and we, we try to interest them. It's not like something like harassment, as you described, like with the, the, the black dress or stuff like that. We don't do that kind of advertising, and we respect too much our audience to go in, in that direction, actually. We try to find stuff like are not selling data, and it's not what something we want to to develop at all. Yeah. To what to what extent you wanted to know your audience? To what extent you wanted to follow your uh, audience? And to what extent you say, I just have a good story. I can create a compelling uh, ad experience that I really don't worry about who my specifically who my audience is. And how do you balance that? Uh, well. We really know our audience, to be true. We have conversations. And I, I think we don't do good native as well, native advertising. And we, we don't work well with brands as well if we don't know what our audience like and if we don't engage conversations with them and so on. So there is a knowledge of the audience, but it, it's not definitely something like with robots and algorithm and something that we sell back and stuff like that. It's like something more instinctive, I would say. So it's uh, complicated, but it's the way we, we work. Like we have a factory and people working like on the ad, uh, ad formats and ad contents that are like working, uh, like uh, observing uh, uh, the, the likes of the, of the community we, we address. Katrina, I think you, know, uh, you said that you wanted to, so in your, in your latest version, you are just stop tracking, but you are not stopping ads. So what will be your advice to uh, media and publishers? Because at this stage, it seems as if they are competing with a lot of people for people's eyeballs. But at the same time, you know, if we want to really have a kind of a, a, you know, good ecosystem for media, we, they still need ad dollar to support their growth. So what will be your advice? So if you're not ad advising them not tracking their users, what should they do instead? That's a difficult question. I think the, the main mistake, and now I'm going to say we again because I was on the publisher side back then, uh, the main mistake we made many, many years ago was um, not fully understanding how ed tech works, yeah. not investing in that, not building out that knowledge and competence um, inside publishing houses. And I think the, the huge publishers like the New York Times, they have super smart people. They're different. But if you look at smaller publishers, at local publishers, they, they don't actually know how many trackers are on their website and how they got there. Because for many years, it hasn't been a one-to-one -one relationship between a publisher and a brand advertiser. And there's this whole chain of, of ad tech and actually from a publisher's perspective of people that pull a lot of money out of the market so that in the end, less and less money uh, ends with the publisher. I think um, publishers need to do their part in building trust with consumers. They need to do their part in um, driving greater transparency. Why are we showing you these ads? What of your data are we tracking? Where does it go to? Um, if 
if I use a, a little add-on, I can see that many websites have 32 trackers on their page. What are they there for? And I do know from experience that you do need certain things for analytics, for better advertising. But do you really need 32 trackers? What do they collect? Where does the data go? Does anybody sell it to anybody? I have no idea as a consumer. And I think that makes more and more consumers inclined to use an ad blocker and opt out of that system. And the other, I think the other thing that often went wrong, publishers due to the way that ad tech works, have no control over or have very little control and, and also chosen not to investigate what ends up on their page. So mm -hmm. there is no deterrent for malware. And we've all seen the many examples. I don't want to go in the morning, read something, and then have fine, fine malware on yeah. my machine. Yeah. But do you encourage maybe publishers to come up with a, like, uh, like, uh, like a statement or a kind of uh, disclaimer saying that these are the things I'm doing and these are the things that I'm not doing. And then you are assured that uh, some, we will collect some of the data, but that's useful for me to give you a good you ad experience, yes. but that's I think, it. I think that, that's one of the big pieces. The other problem is that publishers over time have lost a lot of power in, in the market to yeah. the big ed, ed tech players. And part of the problem was that as publishers, we always saw another publishing brand as the big competitor. For a long time, they haven't seen big advertising companies as the competitor. And so I think publishers need to partner with other publishers to gain back some of that marketing power. It's like the age-old system of collective yeah. bargaining. Yeah. 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 You know, I think that's already happening with uh, publishers gain up against uh, uh, Facebook and others. So your experience with social media platforms, are they friends or are they enemies? Because now they are, there's a new word called frenemies, right? You know, to a certain extent, they give you the platform to really engage the younger audience. But on the other hand, of course, they are the main driver of ad dollars. Yeah, you have to play by their rules rather than by your own rules. So what, share with us a bit more about your dealing with uh, major social media platforms. Well, we work on all platforms because we broadcast our content through platforms. We are a social media company, definitely a social media publisher. Yeah. So we work with Facebook and we work a lot with Snapchat. We are on Discover with them. And that's quite important because we, it's like partnership. Those, they, they help us as well in like the way we are selling stuff and the way we, we, we are telling stuff as well with their platform and so on. So it has been extremely, uh, extremely uh, uh, innovative for us to work with these kind of people actually. We launched a new version on which we can like um, tell stories from Instagram to Snapchat now to Facebook as well and on all platforms as well through Google and stuff like that. So it's really something like uh, has been positive in the way we've been innovative and, and um, these partnerships are really strong for us because audience is over there and it's the codes and the norms the audience wants to see and to have. So, uh, it's like something that's inspiring uh, for the new ad advertising formats and so on. And we have to work with these rules and norms. Yeah. There's also an interesting question from Slido saying that, asking, would, is interactive ads the future? That, you know, from your experience, you know, engaging with a younger audience, are they preferring like more interactive ads? Do you see a future there? Well, <clears throat> I have difficulties with future. I've been like working on internet since 20 years now. And uh, I know that it changes a lot and uh, I don't want to like trust too much like what's going to be the future for uh, native ads. But for sure, I think native ad is the result of a conversation between the brand and the communities. And it improves like the whole uh, product chain and the whole consuming chain and the whole promoting chain. And I think it's definitely something that's po that is positive for sure, but that's going to improve the way as well uh, companies will tell stories and will make stuff. So I think, uh, and uh, Adam from Puma was talking about it just before, 
uh, I think uh, there is going to be a conversation stronger and stronger and something much more collaborative between uh, the platforms, the publishers, the brands, yeah. and the communities. Yeah. And yeah. this is the way I see things. I think we are running out of time, but um, one last question. What would be your advice to brands in the future as a way to really strike a good dialogue with the consumer? What's the kind of ideal scenario in the near future? What's, what's the best way for brands to have a dialogue with the consumer? You know, be it with ads, without ads, with data, without data. I think, first of all, something we haven't mentioned today is, is brand safety. And if you look at, um, over the last years, brands have only cared about what characteristics of an audience can they reach somewhere. They've stopped caring a lot about where does my ad show up. And um, you don't want your ad to show up on a hateful website. You don't want to show up, honestly, next to Alex Jones's info war. And so I think making sure your brand only gets placed in environments that match your brand, that are desirable, is a thing we have, ne or, or brands have neglected over the years and, and need to go back to. And the other thing is I can only emphasize that enter into a dialogue, build community, don't ignore your users. Uh, there's so many passionate users of whatever brand out there. Um, talk to them, find ways to engage them and interact with them. That, that, that is your most powerful base. Yeah. Your suggestion to brand. Sorry. Your suggestion to the brand in the future to have a better way to engage the audience. Um, I think like the responsibilities of media is something on which we have to, to really focus on and the accessibility as well. Because I think it's like really our strength in, uh, in these like uh, years where we can like publish like uh, and communicate a lot with communities. And I think definitely uh, accessibility and responsibility are the, 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 big, the big things for us. And um, I think it's extremely positive uh, to, 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 to build uh, in this upcoming. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're running out of time, but I think this is a very fascinating topic. And I think really, really try to strike a balance between privacy, data, the needs of the brands, the needs of the media, and also at the end of the day, how do we create a better environment where people really don't feel like they are being followed, but at the same time enjoy that they could find the best products and services online. So, so this is a challenge, but it's an interesting challenge. Thank you very much for two of you. Yeah. Thank you. Big applause. And thank you to you. Thank you.